Welcome brothers and sisters, pleasant parishioners and partners of PG to our virtual worship services. We're going to allow just a few moments. We're going to allow a few moments uh, for us, uh, for our members and our friends uh, to come in. We're going to allow a few moments. I know that uh, it is just now 1030 and we want to allow a little bit of time for our pleasant parishioners to come in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, once you come in, please let us know that you're there. Uh, send a thumbs up or an emoji, a heart, uh, just letting us know that you are present. We are thankful for everyone who is logging on to our virtual worship services. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna give just a moment or two uh, while you come in. Again, we're thankful uh, you all could have engaged any other worship services in the world, but you all have decided uh, to tune in to Pleasant Green. And for that, we are thankful. For that, we are thankful. For that, we are thankful. We want to just say just a, a verse or two uh, of a hymn, and then we'll get started. Come on in, come on in, come on in. We just want to share just a few, um, just a verse of this particular hymn, and we will get started. Amen. We just want to give everyone time enough uh, to come in. Uh, we want to give everyone enough time to come in uh, so that you can be a part of our virtual worship services. Amen. Amen. Everyone, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. We want to just share just a verse of blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. All the day long, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior are happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Now y'all help me sing it together at home. This is my story. 
This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Brothers and sisters, song is one of the indispensable pieces of worship. So brothers and sisters, uh, we pray, we sing, we preach, and we offer scripture reading. At this time, brothers and sisters, uh, we want you to be called into worship. The 100 number of Psalms says, let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his, his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all gener generations. You are now called into worship. Thank you, Zion, for that call to worship. We want to pause for a moment of prayer. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you even virtually. God, we know that we'd rather to worship you in person. God, we recognize that this is an uncanny time. But God, we ask that you keep us together as pleasant parishioners. Keep us being the church, even though we are not in the church building. And God, we pray that at such time as that you have summoned us, Lord God, let us return to the building with joy. And Lord God, let us return to the building with gladness. And Lord God, let us return with singing and praying and preaching. Lord God, most of all, we ask God that as we return to the building, God, we return to the building with a level of uh, harmony and unity that will be pleasing in your sight, God. Lord God, we pray that uh, the parishioner that is sick, Lord God, someone is checking in on them. God, we pray that the parishioner that is lonely or abused, that someone encourages them and protects them. God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we know that you have all power. God, have mercy upon this, your church, God, in Jesus name. And God, we know uh, that after you deliver us and after you bring us back into Koinonia Fellowship together, we will be careful to give you all of the praise and all of the glory. And this is in Jesus name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Again, brothers and sisters, welcome, welcome, welcome to our virtual worship services. Uh, again, this is not our ideal way to worship God, but brothers and sisters, this op offers us an opportunity to connect with each other, even though we are not in uh, the worship building. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, although we can't use the sense of touch, uh, in our worship experience, God has allowed us to use our uh, sense of sight and our sense of hearing. Uh, and the word of God says that where there is two or three gathered uh, in the name, uh, in my name, that I will be in the midst. And I just believe that the Lord is in the midst uh, of us even right now today. So brothers and sisters, uh, we want to call your attention to the word of God, but right before we call your attention to the word of God, um, we celebrate all January birthdays. Uh, we celebrate all January birthdays. We thank God for all of our parishioners who celebrate a birthday in January. Amen. Also, brothers and sisters, we want to recognize, uh, we want to recognize uh, one of uh, the Latter-day Prophets in the person of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday 
uh, was on January the 15th, and we celebrate MLK Day on January the 17th. So brothers and sisters, we just want to take a little bit of time to celebrate the life, the lessons, and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was indeed a Latter-day prophet. And I know sometimes we uh, misunderstand what the true meaning of prophet means uh, with all of this modern day prophecy where uh, they're naming it and claiming it, uh, uh, blabbing it and grabbing it. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, your only reference to a prophet is someone telling you that in 15 days, um, uh, if you uh, pay $150 for a prayer cloth, God is going to bless you with a brand new house. Brothers and sisters, that is not the uh, definition of a prophet. A prophet is one uh, who speaks revelations from God uh, and he speaks truth to power. And when I say truth to power, he speaks truth, uh, God's truth, God's revelations uh, to power institutions. And many times, brothers and sisters, we know what happens uh, when one speaks truth to power institutions. Many times they are assassinated, uh, they are martyred, they are crucified. So we take this moment of silence just to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Amen, amen, amen. We celebrate him, we celebrate him in the work that he's done. Brothers and sisters, we also want to invite your attention to the word of God. There is a word from God. There is a word from God. There is someone who needs to hear a word and we plan to share the word of God with you. If you don't mind, turn with me to 2 Corinthians, uh, the second chapter. 2 Corinthians, the second chapter. I know I can't hear your pages turning, but pleasant parishioners, partners of PG, members and friends, uh, I urge you to go to your Bible, even if you're going to you version, even if you're going to the digital uh, Bible on your phone or on your tablet or on your device. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. It's in the New Testament. If you hadn't been to Sunday school in a while, it's in the New Testament. Even if you can't find it there in the New Testament, you can go to the table of contents. 2 Corinthians. I hope somebody is laughing at my dad humor. All right, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, and we're going to read verses 14 through 17. I hear some pages turning in my divine ears imagination. I hear some pages turning. 14 through 17 of chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians. There you will find words similar to this. I'm reading from uh, the Christian Standard Version. But thanks be to God who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. It's an aroma. For to God... We are the fragrance of Christ. Tell somebody at home, you are the fragrance of Christ. Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some, we are an aroma of death leading to death. But to others, we are an aroma of life leading to life. Who is adequate of these things? For we do not market the word of God, or some of your renditions say peddle the word for profit like so many. On the contrary, we speak with sincerity in Christ as from God and before God. Brothers and sisters, if you would, I'd like to use just a couple of words uh, that Paul says 
in verse 14 as a title. Christ's triumphal procession. Christ's triumphal procession. Again, God, we pause now to ask you to bless this word and then let it nourish our souls. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart and the study that is on the script, Lord God, bless the people of God. Let it move through their lives and let it encourage someone today. Lord God, let it be inspiring to someone Lord God, uh, let it be uh, a word that moves them to a place to live a life that is satisfying to you. In Jesus' name, Lord God, let me decrease so that you can increase. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, again, the title that I want to use is Christ's Triumphal Procession. Christ's Triumphal Procession procession. On March the 7th, 1965, civil rights leaders headed out east of Selma, Alabama on U.S. Route 80. They were headed to Montgomery to voice their demands for the right for African Americans to vote. They only got as far as the Edmund Pettus Bridge some about six blocks away from their intended goal, where the state and local lawmen attacked them with billy clubs and with tear gas and then drove them back to Selma. This infamous day, as many of you already know, is called Bloody Sunday. To some, it may have been a crushing defeat but two weeks later, on March the 21st, after receiving a court injunction and federalized protection, hundreds of people marched across the bridge. And by that time, they, when they reached the state capitol on March the 25th, uh, they were at about 25,000 people strong. Less than five months later, as we all know, and history has recorded, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed into the law the Voters' Right Act of 1965. What seemed to have been a crushing defeat was really the seed out of which a glorious victory had sprouted. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, our victory uh, sometimes our defeat uh, is not determined by what happened at any one moment or one given day in our lives, but our victory can be declared in the light uh, of the ultimate outcome of our lives. Apparently, brothers and sisters, this is what Paul is meaning within our text. If you walk with me to the world behind the text because he also refers to a march that seems to lead to defeat instead. And brothers and sisters, uh, instead of uh, defeat, we know that ultimately it is a victory. This was a different kind of march. It wasn't a civil rights march at all, but this particular march was a military march, uh, one that the Corinthian citizens were very familiar with. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, when the Roman Empire conquered a nation, the military forces marched in a triumphal procession to celebrate their victory. The purpose of this procession was to flaunt the power of the victorious nation. By celebrating this way, they reassured themselves and reiterated the Roman emperor held absolute 
dominant and dominion over the entire world. This was a reminder that Rome was still in control. In the procession, people lined up and down the streets cheering for the triumphant army. The victorious general was dazzled in purple. He wore a long robe of purple in the perception. And brothers and sisters, and they, the captured uh, and defeated prisoners were chained and humiliated uh, to the chariot of the general. Priests also marched in procession, swinging their incense back and forth in their incense containers, filling the air with a sweet smell of victory. Those chained and humiliated prisoners were paraded through the streets, and when the procession was over, they were put to death. However, some of them were spared as a sign of mercy on the part of the victorious general. This is the public spectacle to which Paul was speaking of when he says uh, in verse 14, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph with Christ. I like the English Standard Version because it captures it just a little bit better. It says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us into triumphal procession. Brothers and sisters, somebody is missing their shout right there. It's a blessing and we thank God that no matter what circumstances we face in life, no matter what we uh, come to endure, Christ always leads us in a triumphal procession. Brothers and sisters, in this small illustration, Paul applies the image of a victorious general to Jesus Christ. By doing so, he is suggesting that it was not the Roman emperor who had ultimate power, but Jesus Christ, the ultimate ruler of the world. Paul sees himself and all believers as defeated prisoners of war who were chained to the chariot of Christ. However, we are not being led into humiliation. We're not being led into death. Instead, we are being led into victory through Christ in eternal life. Walk with me, saints, and I'll be done in a minute. Paul is trying to tell us that because we have been conquered and captured by Christ, we have victory instead of defeat. We have life instead of death. And I just want to ask you, have you truly been captured by Christ? Because if you've truly been captured by Christ, you'll experience joy instead of humiliation. You'll receive life instead of death. This victory has to do with our standing with Jesus Christ. Because we, those of us uh, who are in Jesus Christ, are assured of having the victory. If you all would just walk with me a few seconds, there are a few things that I want to pull from the text. The first thing that I see that I, that's worth sharing with you from the text is, you are victorious because you follow the Savior. I want to encourage someone right now today that you are victorious because you follow the Savior. You are victorious because you follow the Savior. Tell somebody that you are worshiping with today that you are victorious because you follow the Savior. Christ is leading us. That means we are following him. Following Christ has some positive implications, brothers and sisters. First of all, you all have the victory even when it looks like you are defeated. I, I just want to shout all over this place. Uh, I wish I was behind the pulpit this morning. Brothers and sisters, you have the victory even when it looks like you are defeated. 
Uh, brothers and sisters, as we pay attention to this particular pericope using, uh, he, Paul is using some interesting, an interesting paradox. Paul speaks of captured and defeated prisoners of war who are being paraded in a triumphal procession. They are chained to the chariot of the victorious general. How humiliating is that when you lose, you are chained to the chariot of the victorious general. They are marching you through the city and you are being laughed at and humiliated. Paul is describing the victory. And also, brothers and sisters, he describes our victory using imagery of defeat. Only the Lord can do that. He describes our victory using imagery of defeat. But don't <coughs> allow this paradoxical imagery to throw you off, brothers and sisters, throughout this particular section, beginning in chapter 2, verse 14, and ending in chapter 7, verse 4. Paul over and over again uses paradoxes when describing our position of strength in the midst of weaknesses. Paul continues to use this image of us being weak to describe how strong we are. If you all don't mind, walk with me in chapter 3, verse 5. The apostle says we are insufficient to serve God, but God has made us Sufficient. Come on, walk with me, Bible scholars. Walk with me to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 7 says, we have treasure in clay pots. How is it that we have something so valuable in something so weak? In chapter 5, verse 1, he says, we have a house that will last forever. How many of you all know that in, in life, houses don't last forever, but brothers and sisters, how is it that we can be a house uh, that will last forever? In chapter 6, verse 10, Paul says, we are sorrowful, yet we are rejoicing as poor, yet making many rich and as having nothing uh, but possessing it all. In chapter 2, Paul uses another paradox to describe our victory by talking about our defeat. He says that even though we are like prisoners uh, who have been chained to the chariot of Jesus Christ after being conquered by Christ, he is not leading us to death, but what Christ is doing is leading us to life. And I want somebody to know that, that Christ is not leading us to failure. Christ is not leading us to damnation, but Christ is leading us to eternal life. As a matter of fact, I'm reminded of when Jesus said that I came that you might have life more abundantly. Brothers and sisters, I'm also reminded of the moment when Jesus said that I came not to condemn the law, but I came that you might have life and that you might have, I came to fulfill the law and that you might have life and life more abundantly. The apostle had been concerned about the church at Corinth. He had written a letter to them earlier to rebuke uh, them and give them correction. So he was worried whether or not the church at Corinth had received the letter joyfully. In fact, in verse 13, he said he was so worried that he couldn't have any rest. He, he didn't have any rest in his spirit because he hadn't heard from Titus regarding how they accepted the letter. Now, Paul was obviously, uh, he obviously heard back from Titus uh, but that the people of Corinth received this letter graciously. So he breaks out into a hymn. And I don't know about you, but when I hear good news, I uh, sometimes my soul cannot help 
but to break out into a hymn. This is exactly what Paul does after he heard that the Corinthian church accepted his letter of correction and rebuke with joy. He busts out into a praise. He says, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Now, when I looked at it first, brothers and sisters, uh, I, at first I found this problematic. When what, what did Paul mean about God always leading us into triumph? Because, uh, brothers and sisters, I tried to be very practical in my theology and help you to understand that always in life you will not always experience victory. So I had a tension in this text that what did Paul mean that Christ will always lead you to victory because life does not always look victorious. Sometimes it doesn't seem like we have the victory at all. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, if you pay attention to the life of Paul, if you look at the life of Paul, even in Paul's life, Paul did not experience victory at all junctures. As a matter of fact, we see in the life of Paul, Paul experienced a whole lot of failures. But brothers and sisters, as I began to look at his life, I felt like the failures were helping to mature his faith. If you look at Paul's life, he experienced some failures. Walk with me, Bible scholars, if you don't mind, you all walk with me through uh, the timeline of Paul's life. You all remember in Iconium, Paul was stoned and left for dead. In Philippi, he and Silas were thrown in jail. He went to Thessalonica and the citizens ran him out of town. He went uh, to Berea and the same thing happened there. In Athens and the Greeks mocked him and laughed at him on Mars Hill. Talk to me, somebody. Then he went to Ephesus and a riot broke out. He went to Jerusalem and they arrested him in the temple. He went to the wrong, he went to Rome and they ultimately ended up killing him. So life does not always look victorious for Paul. But the apostle is telling you that your victory is not defined by what happened in your life on one given day or any given moment. Brothers and sisters, your victory is not always defined by one day of your life. If you don't believe me, let's take the example of Jesus. On Friday, he didn't look very victorious. On Friday, uh, they put a cross on his shoulder. On Friday, they marched him from Judgment Hall to Judgment Hall. On Friday, they put nails in his hands and nails in his feet. They stretched him wide and they lifted him high and dropped him low. Brothers and sisters, but Jesus is essentially telling us, don't judge him by what happened on Friday, which is the first day of the weekend. You can't judge Jesus by the way things look on Friday because again, that's the beginning of the weekend. But brothers and sisters, we can't judge Jesus by just what happened on Friday. Jesus is sharing with us if we're going to judge him, if we're going to judge uh, the Lord's victory uh, we've got to look at uh, the weekend in entirety. If you're going to judge Jesus' victory, you've got to judge the whole weekend because he died on Friday. But all oh, brothers and sisters, what encourages in me is that early one Sunday morning, he got up with all power. That's why, brothers and sisters, I can tell a person who has gotten a pink slip on his desk and at his job, uh, you can go on and praise God. 
because the pink slip doesn't define who you are. That's why I can tell the person who has cancer, uh, brothers and sisters, that he's also leading you to victory, whatever the outcome is. That's why I can tell the person with a wayward child, God is still leading you to victory because your victory is not defined by any one moment of your life. When you follow Christ, you have victory even though it does not look like it. You also have victory because whatever you go through, Jesus has already been through it. I want to encourage you that you're not facing life alone. Whatever you are going through, Jesus has already been through it. Whatever you are going through, Jesus has already been through it. And not only has he already been through it, but he's already won. Paul said, we are like prisoners chained to Christ's chariot. This means he's leading us, which implies that whatever we go through, he's already been through it and won with victory. Somebody said, well, Jesus hasn't gone through what I've gone through. Somebody might have said, well, what about temptation? Yes, Jesus has faced temptation. He's been through that. He's been there, done that. As a matter of fact, that t-shirt is on Hebrews 4 and 15 that says he was in all points tempted as we are yet. Without sin. Somebody say, well, has the Lord ever encountered storms? Yes, the Lord has encountered storm. He went through that in Mark 4 and 39. Jesus told the storm on the sea. Peace, be still. Has he gone through rejection? Somebody may be saying, well, Jesus never went through rejection. He's been through rejection because brothers and sisters, he went uh, through on John 1 and 11. It says he came to his own town and his own received him not. Did he have family problems? He's been through that. He went through that. His brothers and sisters did not even believe on him at first. Did he ever have financial problems? He never had financial problems like you and I because he's the God of all. Oh, yes, he did. Because if you consider Luke 9 and 58, Jesus said foxes have holes, birds have nests. But here it is. I, the son of man, don't have anywhere to lay my head Jesus has gone through it all. He's gone through scandal. He went through scandal because at his birth, the virgin was held in suspicion by local town folk. Has he gone through depression? Yes, he's gone through depression. If you don't believe me, you all remember when he went through depression at the Garden of Eden in Matthew 26 and 38. He says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death as he, brothers and sisters, face the cross. Jesus has experienced it all. Somebody said, well, he, has he experienced disappointment with friends? Yes, he's experienced disappointment with friends. You all remember Peter, don't you? Peter denied him three times. Does he have false friends? Yes, he had one of his own disciples, one that walked close with him to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Did he have fair weather friends? Yes, he had folks that was with him at some point and fell off at the other. He went through that. He died, brothers and sisters. And someone may be saying, well, uh, did he face death? Yes, he died. He died on Friday. And brothers and sisters, he's also experienced having the lowest moment in life. Because after he died on Friday, the record is that on Saturday, he went to hell. He went to hell to reclaim all those who was lost. He went through that, brothers and sisters. But he also uh, experienced victory. Because like I mentioned earlier on a Sunday morning, he woke up out of death and declared all power 
you have the victory because whatever you go through, he's already been through it. And brothers and sisters, as I press on, as I seek to close, there's another thing that I want to share with you. You are victorious because of the fragrance that you spread. You are victorious by the fragrance that you spread. Walk with me. I'm not quite done with you yet. I know you're going to get back to your lives in just a few minutes, but just walk with me. The Apostle Paul says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses. And I want to share with you what that word diffuses mean. It means to manifest or spread the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Now, Paul he shifts metaphors here and talks about fragrance. That God uses this fragrance to spread the aroma of his knowledge everywhere. Paul is saying that wherever the gospel goes, wherever the gospel is preached, we are spreading the fragrance, the scent, and the aroma of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that Paul uses this olfactory metaphor because a fragrance goes wherever it wants to go. Brothers and sisters, oftentimes I can still be sleeping in bed, but there's a fragrance that tends to wake me up when uh, First Lady is trying to be kind. Uh, brothers and sisters, sometimes I can be still asleep and then I smell the fragrance even though even though the door is closed. I, I smell the fragrance of sausage and bacon. I smell the fragrance of, uh, of some pancakes being flipped. In other words, brothers and sisters, you can close the door, but you can still smell the fragrance. In fact, the fragrance uh, can be so strong that it can be on the other side of the door and you still can smell it. Uh, I remember my New Testament uh, scholar teacher, professor in seminary, Mitzi Minor. She said one time, she said, you can shut the doors and the windows. You can uh, douse the lights. Brothers and sisters, uh, you can refuse to eat or drink and stick one's hands in one's pocket, thus shutting off the senses of sight, sound, and taste, and touch. But the fragrance will seep in anyway, under and around the doors and windows. All I'm trying to say to you brothers and sisters, in the same way God uses us, to diffuse the fragrance uh, and the aroma of the knowledge uh, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in our lives. Brothers and sisters, the Lord uses you to be a sweet smelling fragrance in the world of unbelievers. Now, if you look at this irony, Paul speaks to the triumphal procession that the Roman Empire would stage to flaunt their absolute power over the world. Nevertheless, the same Roman Empire, the, uh, the empire that tried to stop the church, collapsed centuries ago. And the blessing is that the same church that the Roman Empire tried to stop by hanging Jesus on the cross is the same church that is still around today. What I'm trying to share with you, brothers and sisters, that when you are a part of the church, you experience victory. Furthermore, the aroma that we spread uh, and the aroma that we send around, it creates a crisis moment. Here's another tension in the text. Look what Paul says in verse 15 and 16. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are also perishing. To the one, we are an aroma of death leading to death. But to the other, we are an aroma of life 
leading to life. And I, I wondered about that, brothers and sisters. I, 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 I struggled with that. I was like, what, what is Paul saying? What, well, allow me to unpack this. Paul now pushes the, the metaphor just a little bit further. And he says, not only does God use us to spread the fragrance of the message of Jesus Christ to the world, but we are the fragrance of Christ. In the triumphal Roman procession, the priests would line the streets. They would swing their incense back and forth in their containers, and all of the prisoners were chained to the chariot of the conquering general. They could smell the aroma of the incense as they were being paraded down the streets. Uh, those prisoners headed uh, to the city square to be executed. It was an aroma of death. But those other prisoners who were spared for them, it was an aroma of life. Paul was using this metaphor of fragrance to emphasize that whenever the gospel is preached, there is a crisis, a moment that arises in our lives. And then that one has to make a decision either to accept the gospel and have life or to reject it and have death. The apostle is saying to us that the gospel that we preach has an aroma sounding or from it. There is aroma that is seeping from it. For those who accept it, it is a sweet aroma of life. For those who reject it, uh, the gospel, it smells like uh, a million dead corpses. So brothers and sisters, how does the gospel smell to you? Uh, is it a gospel that causes you to want to keep it? Because if it smells good to you, then it is a gospel of life. But if it is a gospel that causes you to say that I don't believe in this or I don't know about right now, it is a gospel. Brothers and sisters, it is an aroma of death. And I want to ask you, uh, because we are those uh, who are not only preaching the gospel, living the gospel. We are not only, the gospel is not only the fragrance, but we are the fragrance of Christ. I want to ask you this. How do you smell? How do you smell at work? How do you smell at home? How do you smell at school? How do you smell when things don't go your way? Are you emitting the fragrance of Christ? Can people smell Christ on you and around you? How do you smell at church? How do you smell when you are away from church? Are you emitting the fragrance of Christ? I know y'all ready to go. Uh, a couple more things and I'm done. You are victorious because you have been made to fit, have been made fit to serve Christ. You are victorious because you have been made fit to serve Christ. In light of the ramifications of what Paul has just said, Paul makes or asks a query. He asks the question at the end of verse 16, who is sufficient for these things? That word sufficient means competent or equal to the task. In other words, Paul, after identifying the life and death ramifications of the gospel, asked who is sufficient and in and of himself to handle the word. It's a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is no one is sufficient. Pleasant parishioners, none of us are sufficient in and of ourselves to handle the word, but Paul answers his own question in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient and ministers of the new covenant. In other words, brothers and sisters, the only reason that God uses any of us is because God made us sufficient for use. God made us fit 
for God's use. And I want you to know whatever capacity that you serve, whatever capacity that you serve, brothers and sisters, God, he only uses you because he has made you fit for service because all of us have faults and flaws and failures because brothers and sisters, all of us have shortcomings, but it is only because God made you fit that God uses you. Whatever capacity that you serve in, whether you are deacon, whether you are trustee, whether you are usher, whether you are choir member, you are not fit to serve. You're only fit to serve because God made you fit. Whether you're an associate minister or a pastor, it, we are not worthy because brothers and sisters, I share with you this, that I've, I'm not worthy to preach God's gospel because I've had some shortcomings and some failures in life. But I thank God because God took me and made me fit for sharing the gospel. Everyone God used in the Bible had some kind of shortcoming. You all remember Moses, don't you? Moses uh, told God that he couldn't speak well. Jeremiah informed God that he was too young. Sarah said she was too old. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. Timothy had stomach problems, but God doesn't allow our shortcomings to stop him from using you for his glory. God makes us fit for him. You are victorious as I move to log off. You are victorious because you have been faithful to scriptures. Look at verse 17. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God. Paul asked in verse 16, who is sufficient of these things? He begins verse 17 with the connective words for, which implies that there were those in Paul's day who thought they were competent to handle the word of God in and of themselves. The word peddling is a commercial word and it conveys the idea of a shabby businessman who sells wine but he waters the wine down in order to stretch it. And in short, he dilutes the wine. I'm sure you've heard of the word peddler. He's a peddler. A peddler is someone who makes profit off of selling shoddy goods. Paul basically is saying we are not as so many peddlers or diluters of the word of God. Paul says he is instead preaching the word of God with sincerity. The Apostle Paul continues, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. In other words, when we preach the gospel, we are those who sit ourselves Instead, brothers and sisters, we are not those who sent ourselves, but instead we have been commissioned and sent by God. When we preach, we preach of our, out of our relationship with Jesus Christ. When we preach, we are preaching as though God is our audience. We need to be members of a church, brothers and sisters, where the word of God is being preached and taught faithfully. When the scriptures are taught with integrity, it leads us uh, not to defeat, but it leads us to victory. Paul uses the imagery of us being tried in a triumphant procession. He says that we've been chained to the chariot of Jesus Christ. But Jesus, we ask, uh, where are you leading us? What is going to happen at the end of this procession? Where are you going to take us? We can rest assured that he's not leading us to humiliation. Jesus Christ is not leading us to humiliation 
or damnation. He's not leading us to failure and he's not leading us to a hopeless future. But I want to encourage you that Jesus Christ is leading you to victory. Brothers and sisters, the virtual door of the church is open. The virtual door of the church is open. The virtual door of the church is open. You can become a part uh, of the church, uh, and in particular, the ministry of Pleasant Green uh, by a couple of ways. Brothers and sisters, you can contact our church office at 314-535-7548, and you can leave a message, a voice message there. Or, brothers and sisters, you can send us an email at ghpruitt at gmail.com. You can leave us an email there. Whether you decide to leave us a voice or an email message, we will respond to you as soon as possible. Brothers and sisters, we are thankful that you have decided to share with us on today. We are thankful that you have decided to share with us on today. Also, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you, or uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for your continued faithfulness and generosity. Thank you for uh, continuing to give to the ministry of Pleasant Green. Uh, brothers and sisters, the word of God often uh, shares with us, we honor God with our wealth. Uh, Proverbs 3 and 9 says, honor God with your wealth and the first fruits of your income. Brothers and sisters, you can do that. One of two ways uh, at this point, uh, you can send a check or a money order to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church. You can send a check or a money order at Ple to Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church at 1220 REV GH Pruitt Place, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113. You can send a check or a money order uh, to uh, Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, at REV, Rev, G.H. Pruitt, uh, um, 63, uh, 1220, REV, G.H. Pruitt Place, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113. Or, brothers and sisters, uh, you can log on to our website. You can log on to our website uh, at www.pgmbc. Someone can put it in the thread there, www.pgmbc. STL dot O-R-G. Uh, and you can click on our giving tab. Uh, once you click on our giving tab, uh, you can give there electronically. Brothers and sisters, we thank you so much again for your continued faithfulness in giving. And very, very, very soon, you will be able to see your giving and your generosity and your tithes at work in the life of the church. You'll be surprised uh, at how um, Pleasant Green is transforming from the inside out. Brothers and sisters, again, we are thankful uh, for you. We're blessed by all of our guests. If you are a guest of Pleasant Green, brothers and sisters, I want to say to you right now, you are so welcome. You're welcome to join us in uh, our 830 conference call. It's called the Worship Over the Wire. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, you can find uh, that information on our uh, Facebook page, uh, our Worship it Over the Wire conference call number uh, and access code. We'll be putting that up very, very soon uh, at 8.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. You can join us on the Worship Over the Wire. Also, brothers and sisters, you can join us for Bible study uh, on that same conference call uh, on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock p.m. We are thankful for you. There are a couple of other things that we'll be sharing with you in the future. We are thankful for you. With that being said, brothers and sisters, I pray that you have gotten something out of this worship service. I pray that uh, the sermon has blessed you as much as the study has blessed me. With that being said, brothers and sisters, let us pause for a word of benediction. God, now we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your persistence. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for your peace. And we thank you for the pleasant parishioners and partners of PG. God, right now we ask that you have mercy upon all of us. God, help us to draw close to you. 
And Lord God, we pray that you continue to smile upon the ministry of Pleasant Green so the ministry of Pleasant Green can be all that you have called her to be. God, let us be efficient. Let us be effective. And Lord God, let us worship you with a God quality of excellence. God, in Jesus' name, God, we thank you for every hand that is a part of the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church ministry. God, thank you for each minister and God, we thank you for each deacon and each trustee, God, each member of the church. God, have mercy. And God, we pray that you continue to keep us together while we are apart. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of God's glory with exceedingly joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. May we all say amen, 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 amen. God bless you. God bless you.